No one started yet. Good morning. Today is Wednesday, March 18th, 10.01 a.m. You are here with your legal team at Family Law Matters. And the purpose of this series of podcasts is to shed some light and give you some guidance as to what we are going through right now with the outbreak of COVID-19 and how it affects your case and the suggestions and recommendations of the legal team here at Family Law Matters. You are joined by five attorneys. I am going to allow each attorney an opportunity to introduce themselves so you know who uh, is speaking. We will, this is open for um, the public, so clients will be able to come in, post questions. Please, if you have a question, make sure that you post it. We'll get those answered. We have a series of topic and a series of questions that we're gonna go through. And um, this also will be posted on our YouTube channel, our website, and other forms of social media. So I'm gonna start with you, Gina. Can you give us a brief intro about yourself, please? Sure, I am a family law attorney. I've been practicing for 23 years, starting in May. I am one of the attorneys at Family Law Matters and we specialize or we emphasize, I should say, all issues concerning family law. That's divorce, domestic violence, support of all kinds and custody matters. Perfect, thank you. Christy, you're up next. Hi, my name is Christy Bergamo. I am a senior attorney here at Family Law Matters. I've been practicing for 17 years. Um, prior to coming here, I had my own practice in Orange County for 12 years. So this is exclusively what I do. Awesome, thank you. All right, Colleen, you're up next. Good morning, my name is Colleen Robinson. I'm a family law attorney here at Family Law Matters as well. And I've been practicing for over 10 years all over Southern California. Okay, and Sharice, I know we can't see you, but we can hear you. You're up next. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sharice Smith. I, again, am a family law attorney here at Family Law Matters. I have been a pro practicing for approximately 10 years, um, primarily in Southern California in the area of family law. Perfect, thank you. And my name is Bashar Shahada. I'm also an attorney. I am the managing partner here at Family Law Matters. Um, I've only been licensed for three years, but I'm surrounded by over decades of legal experience, so you're definitely in good hands. Okay, so let's get straight to the topic that is at hand. One of the biggest questions that people have is the effects of COVID-19 on custody orders. So one of the specific questions that we have is how does COVID-19 affect cu current custody orders and visitation schedules? And I am going to start with you, Sharice. I'm sure. So first and, for first and foremost, what uh, we would encourage everyone to do is follow your court orders. Your court orders are going to be your guideline as to how you should share custody. Um, and you want to make sure that you're taking a good look at those orders. Um, in addition to that, we want you to be proactive. Reach out to the other side. This is a very uh, stressful time for everybody um, in the current climate that we're in. Reach out to the other side. See if there are different orders that might make more sense. At the end of the day, everyone is concerned about the best interests of the child. If you and the other party are able to come to um, some orders that would be more conducive for your child at this time, then make sure that you take the time to write those out. Either that's through talking parents, if your court order um, designates that as the space for you guys to communicate. If you don't have that specific order, then you can use text messages, emails, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Also, if you're unsure about your court orders, reach out to your attorney. We're here to help you. We can clarify any court orders um, that you may have questions with, and we can also reach out to the other side and try to mediate uh, for you if there are some issues that uh, the two of you are not able to work out amongst yourselves. But remember, right now is the perfect time for parties to co-parent with each other, to bring a united front. Your children are already dealing with school closures, they're dealing with their sports being limited or canceled, maybe even a cancellation of prom. It would be awesome for them to see that their parents are not fighting at this time and that they're able to come to a united front regarding the issues that of custody and visitation. One big area that we want to look at is school closures. So if your children are 
um, in an area where schools are closed, which I believe predominantly most of our clients are dealing with this issue, it's important to know that school closures don't amount to a specific holiday, um, for instance, spring break. Um, so you want to follow your court order parenting time, whatever your default parenting time is for the entire the rest of the year, that's what you're going to follow right now during the school closures. Um, but just keep in mind that most of the school closures do encompass the period of spring break. So if your court order has a specific provision for spring break, we're going to ask that you follow that specific provision only for that period of time. And I if think you're that's a great distinction, Cherise the difference between, because this period is going to overlap with spring break and right. parties need to make sure that they understand that that overlap, there's two different orders that will be in place. One that will apply to the period that's not included in spring break and one that applies to the period of spring break through the school. Correct. Correct. And with the schools being closed, your orders may um, provide that parties are to pick up and do their exchanges directly at the school. If the schools close, this is again another opportunity for parents to reach out to each other, pick another designated location, whether that's either the parents uh, respective homes or maybe just another um, neutral location that will work for the, you know, best interest of both parties involved. Um, and then the last point that I really want to stress is Due to the current climate and due to COVID-19, the availability for court is extremely limited. So we really want to encourage um, parents to, again, I keep saying the word co-parent because it's going to be very important at this time to try to co-parent, do all that you can to make sure that you guys are on a united front regarding um, your specific court orders. And I'm just going to recap first and foremost, follow your court orders to the best of your ability. If you don't have the ability to do that, you're going to want to reach out to the other side to see if you guys can come up with an alternative that will work best for everyone involved, specifically keeping in mind the best interests of the children. Um, there are going to be certain situations that are exigent um, that may require some type of court involvement. You're going to want to reach out to your attorney to let us know about those specific situations. Just keep in mind the availability of court is limited and we may or may not be able to get you into court right away. And I also want to add, if I may, Sharice, that if you're unable to co-parent with the other side and you're running into a problems, um, even though you may have some sort of legal remedy, it's not going to help you here and now. So use all other resources that you have. One of the resources that you'll have is your attorneys. We can reach out to the other side or the other attorney and try to coordinate and be as cordial as we possibly can be. Absolutely. Perfect. Now, Cherise, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, what happens if one party is on isolation? What if they are, you know, they've been advised to isolate because they've been in contact with somebody who may or may not have COVID-19? Or what if they're just taking it as an extra precaution just to make sure that it, it doesn't contribute to the spread of COVID-19? How does that affect their custody orders? Um, again, you, we want to make sure that parties are following their court orders. If you have been asked to quarantine or isolate for whatever reason, whether it's a, a self-imposed isolation or mandated from your health professional, you want to immediately reach out to the other side um, and let them know what's going on. Keep them in the loop and again, try to come to some type of agreement as to how the children are going to be shared at this time. There may be a situation where if you have to isolate, um, the other party may lose a couple of days of their uh, timeshare, but that's your opportunity to maybe add some additional time somewhere else or down the line. Um, so there's always, always going to be a remedy um, to address the situation. I think that um, parties need to keep their health um, at the forefront of uh, what's of the decisions that are being made. Um, but I think the, the main point is make sure you convey the information to the opposing party as soon as possible. Try to come to some type of uh, resolution of how you guys can, can still co-parent and uh, share the children accordingly. And if you can't, like you said, reach out to your attorney so that we can help you. Awesome. And then one other question concerning custody, and I know you hit, it, hit on it a little bit, but I do want to give it a little bit more light is 
what happens specifically at the exchanges if the exchanges are to take place at school or after school hours how can clients um still follow that court order through this this temporary period of isolation um what i would suggest is if your school um is closed and the pickup is let's say for after school um we generally know what time children get out our children get out of school so if that's 2:15 or 2:30 the exchange time would still be at that specific time of day but the parties can um, communicate with each other where they're going to do that uh, pickup from. Maybe it's going to be at each other's respective homes, or maybe they're going to meet at a Starbucks in a neutral location. The main point is communication. Communication is going to be key at this time. Um, communicate where you guys would like to do your exchanges, um, and it may even still be at school. They're going to just exchange at school, but the school is obviously closed. Um, and if you guys come to an understanding of where that pickup is going to be for this time frame only, you might want to just jot that down in talking parents or via text message so that everybody's on the same page. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Colleen, I'm going to direct the next subset of questions towards you, and it's still under the topic of custody, but it specifically has to do with supervised visits. Parties that have that are exercising supervised visits or parties that have supervised orders for the uh, non-custodial parent, how does this isolation and the, the updates with COVID-19 affect those? <clears throat> Well, that depends. One is you have to look at your court order. What does the court order state? Does the court order state regarding supervised visitation, is it to be professionally monitored? Or does it say professionally monitored or by, mutual, by a third party by mutual agreement? If it's professionally monitored, um, the professional supervised visitation monitor is kind of in control. If they're canceling the visitation due to the health concerns right now, they have the right to do that under the current law. So we have to follow the court orders. I mean, that's going to be an ongoing theme here is to follow the court orders because we are officers of the court. We can't tell you to violate your court orders. Um, so if that's the case, it's going to be up to the supervisor, the professional supervised visitation monitor. Now, if your custody, your supervised custody orders fall under the other category or by mutual agreement by a third party, then the two of you, the two parents can reach out to one another to pick a mutually agreeable third party to supervise the visitation. And again, because of the stress and all the anxiety and what's going on right now, I think it's imperative that the parties try to be reasonable with one another and not withhold or just unreasonably deny a third party that could be to supervise the visitation. Right now, this is all temporary. I think we could all agree that <clears throat> it's in the best interest of the kids to have some sort of visitation. Clearly, they need to be supervised for whatever reason, for safety issues, but to try to allow that, that visitation to, to be ongoing. Perfect. Thank you. And so if the supervised monitor themselves don't feel comfortable conducting the supervised visit, What's the remedy? Um, well, if I understand that, so if the supervised visitation monitor is canceling your, is canceling the visitation, is that the question? Yes. So the other option is one, you could reach out to see if there's other professionally supervised visitation monitors available. And as long as the, the, the two parents can agree as to who's going to be doing a professionally supervised, then that's not a problem. But if you run out of professionally supervised monitors, let's so say you go through an entire list, you can't find anybody because everybody's having the same health concern, then we're going to have to wait until the time, this current quarantine or the, this current health situation is over and help, and then professional supervised visitation monitors are able to resume their services. And I would imagine that if you, if they, if enough, that you could ask professionally supervised visitation monitors to contact you when they feel that the environment is is right to continue with those professional supervised patients. Perfect. Thank you for that answer. And I'm going to open it to um, Gina and Christy if you guys have any last minute comments on the topic specifically of custody and supervised visits. Christy? 
I don't. I think uh, our attorneys answered those questions very thoroughly. I think the theme here is to just be considerate, um, realize that this is hopefully a very temporary situation and that it really needs to be stressed that our only remedy right now truly is communicating with one another, allowing us to facilitate that communication because the courts are, are not going to be a viable option for you um, for, for a while. So, you know, just keep that in mind and just know if you're the one that is not in quarantine or something to that effect and the other parent is, you know, think about how you would feel if the shoe was on the other foot. So, you, you know, there is going to be some visitation that you're either going to miss or that you're not going to be allowed to, to afford the other parent. Just be considerate of that and know and just assume that and just throw to, out to the other parent that, look, even though you can't see our child right now, um, I will certainly, you know, we'll, we can coordinate some makeup time later on when this passes. And I think that's really important to add because then I think they'll be less reluctant to say no or to be difficult about it. And I think we need to be very mindful of that. Awesome, thank you for that. Gina? The only thing I have to add is these are times we've never seen before. These are situations we've never encountered before and hopefully we'll never encounter again. So we're gonna to have to come up with creative solutions and that's what we're here for you for, to do. Perfect, thank you, Gina. Gina, since I have you here, I'm going to um, kind of address the, the next subset of questions towards you. And those are specifically, specifically concerning domestic violence restraining orders. So what is the remedy if the parties are, for example, isolating, but they're forced to stay in the same residence and there are instances and things are heating up and there, there may be some sort of domestic violence involved. Sure, let's talk about what domestic violence is first of all. There's different types of domestic violence as we here at Family Law Matters have discussed many times. There's things such as harassment, but there's also physical violence and there's different levels of physical violence. So depending on what's happening, uh, there may be different remedies. For instance, if there's some sort of physical altercation where it's involving pushing, slapping, leaving a mark in some way, some sort of a um, physical altercation that results in an injury, the remedy would be to call 911. That would be an automatic arrest, an automatic criminal uh, protective order, and what we call an emergency protective order would be issued. That's where the police officer would call a, a judge on call and get protective orders put in place immediately. That would include arresting the person, giving the victim exclusive use of the home, meaning that the other person could not come in the home, and also the other person, the, the perpetrator could not contact the victim in any way. No telephone, no messages, no email, whatever. That's number one. The second level would be perhaps um, throwing things, breaking things, uh, following somebody around the house, spying on somebody. Uh, that may require civil intervention and that would allow the victim to go to the courthouse and get protective orders. There are judges on call and there are judges sitting in the courtrooms for these types of remedies. So if the police cannot intervene or refuse to intervene, we still can obtain restraining orders for people who are victims. We can also go to court and get permanent restraining orders for these types of people. And then there's maybe annoying type of domestic violence. We all are gonna have cabin fever by the time this is over. And if it is maybe less um, serious, perhaps it's arguing, perhaps they're just um, not getting along, a restraining order may not be appropriate. It may be, I don't know what the remedy would be. Maybe they can't leave. Maybe they stay on different sides of the house. But 
there could be remedies depending on the seriousness. I guess that's where, where, where we have to distinguish. Point is, is if there is domestic violence, you can get a restraining order. You can go to the courts, even though the courts are otherwise closed. Okay, and typically what's the turnaround for, so let's say there is um, legitimate grounds for a restraining order. There is some sort of violence outbreak. The, the emergency protective order is issued, and then there is an ongoing family law case. Should they contact us immediately to file the restraining order? And if so, what's the time frame for getting a hearing? Sure, the time frame for getting a hearing is unknown. The time frame for getting relief is virtually immediate. So we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Just what's today, Wednesday, just in the two days that we've been in the office, things have become more and more restrictive. I think it's clear that the courts are going to be open for what we call a temporary restraining order. The courts are going to issue that immediate protective order and the turnaround for that is approximately 24 hours maximum. That's from the time you file the paperwork to the time that the judge signs an order and gives the victim protection. This does not require an in-person in person court appearance. It's done what we call over the counter, meaning we file the restraining order, the, the clerk walks it back to the court, the court reviews it, and if they believe it is strong enough for physical protection, it's signed right there and it can be picked up at the courthouse. The courthouse is open for that. Typically, the trial would be three weeks from that. Whether or not those trials are gonna be moved out beyond that three weeks is still yet to be seen. My guess is that the hearings on the permanent restraining orders in short order within the next week or two are going to be moved out because of this crisis. And if they're moved out, does that mean that the temporary order remains in place until that permanent hearing? Yes. The law says that these orders must be heard within three weeks unless there's good cause. I'm, I'm, it's my belief that there's going to be some sort of orders and some sort of finding that the current crisis is good cause to move all temporaries to a later date. That hasn't yeah. happened, it's my suspicion. So it will extend, extend the temporary order until that hearing, at which point the trial will determine whether it is dismissed or granted for whatever period of permanent time. Correct. And you can already sense the, the advantages that people are going to try to gain over each other. If uh, my husband is annoying me, how easy would it be to call up, get a restraining order, maybe make false allegations? And then that restraining order will likely be granted for an indefinite period of time. When I say indefinite, three or probably beyond the three weeks, maybe six weeks. Because what's going to happen is the courts are going to become incredibly congested once they reopen. They're only hearing maybe one in 50 or 100 cases right now. So things are going to be pushed out. People are going to have children they're not going to be able to see for a while. People are going to be locked out of their house without any notice. And these are going to be incredibly common over the next couple of weeks. And I think these are the kinds of issues we at Family Law Matters and other family law attorneys are going to need to have to address. So to recap regarding domestic violence, if there are instances of domestic violence and you believe that you need the court's protection, contact your attorney immediately. Let's discuss the facts and the details. And if it rises to the level of a restraining order or harassment, and we believe that you need immediate protection, we'll file it with the court. We'll find out the result, the temporary results within approximately 24 hours of the filing. And then the hearing date will be set tentatively within three weeks. And then if for some reason this isolation, this COVID-19 crisis does not um, go away, um, and is not remedied, then it's likely that that hearing will get continued to a later date. And But the good news is the temporary remains in order. Is that fair to say? 
good and bad news because right. if you're falsely accused, which is the people that I'm concerned about, and I think Christy nodding her head is concerned about those people as well, the people that cannot get into court, the people that want to prove their innocence, even though that's not the, the proper legal term, but who want to prove that a restraining order doesn't apply, they're going to be out of court and they're going to desperately need some legal help. Absolutely. And Gina, I, I'm going to ask you a question that John asked here. It's not related to um, domestic violence specifically, but it relates to the rescheduling of court dates because it's it's kind of along the lines of well what happens if we have court dates that are coming up do, do we get because we have a court date this week do we get first availability when the courts reopen or is this how what's the criteria that the courts using for rescheduling and moving these dates further out sure they're going day by day there's thousands and thousands of court dates that the the clerks are having to reschedule and so they're in crisis mode. They do not have enough staff to call everybody and reschedule these dates. They're doing it without notice. In other words, they're looking at today's calendar. They're looking at each department in all of Riverside County. This is going on Riverside, San Bernardino, LA, all of California, I believe, is, is rescheduling their court dates. And so the next available date is where it's going. Right now, I believe they're out through May 5th, every date through May 5th. Is that, no, is it April? What is it, gals? Do you know? I know one of the departments that they're continuing them out till May and June. Okay. And Riverside, but I don't, I don't know if there are other departments or even San Diego. I believe that all trials are go beyond, all trials before. May 15th are going to be automatically scheduled. That seems to be the notice we got yesterday. So they're just going uh, hearing by hearing and putting it wherever they can fit it. First available date, but you also have to remember that we're already scheduled through probably May 15th or maybe even June 1st with dates that people filed. So there's there's two types of court dates. There's the ones where people walked in papers and they're requesting a date. And then there's court dates that are in the courtroom right now that need to be set out. So all of these dates have to be um, juggled to figure out where they put these people. And some dates have more power than others and have more priority. For instance, domestic violence restraining orders come first. They have to come first by law. Custody is supposed to come first. Whether or not it will, will remains to be seen. So I imagine they're going to be taking some of that into account too when they figure out where these dates lie. Gina, may I comment as well? Absolutely, Christy. Go ahead. Okay. So also uh, the clients need to understand that there's the difference also or the distinction between a hearing and a trial. Okay. A lot of my clients um, and I know, and I know that they're concerned because we've been in court, we've gone through the TRC, we've, you know, got the first quote unquote available date that was months and months out. And I know that a lot of my clients have waited diligently for these dates. Um, and <laughs> at, as we sit here, I would presume that trials would also be a priority to get to be heard as well. But unfortunately, as I sit here today, I, I don't know. Um, I will, I, I don't know if that's gonna be the case, but I would hope so. So I think we just need to keep our finger on the pulse about how these things are being uh, shifted around. But a regular request for order is a hearing. It's a lot shorter. I've had, I had, um, a, you know, my, my trial dates, because I do do a lot of the litigation, are two, three, four, you know, four days long, whatever it is. And um, they're, so they're trying to have to juggle to fit that in and figure out those places as well. What I've seen in one case, because one of my trials has been continued in Hemet, is that they are, they are respecting like the 130 calendar versus the 830 calendar, which I think is, is, is a glimmer of hope because my concern was that they were just gonna put 
everything back on an 830 calendar and then let the chips fall where they may. But in this particular instance, they did, I had a, a, a half day and a whole day and they continued it out to a half day and a whole day. So that's encouraging. Um, but I think that distinction also needs to be made for, for the trial issues. And we just don't know enough yet about every specific department and, and how they're handling those trial dates as well. And another unknown factor um, is that we don't know and the courts don't know how long this is going to last. So they've made some um, temporary orders right now or temporary decisions that for the next two or three weeks out, all the hearings on the calendar are to be moved to a later date, but we don't know come April 1st or April 7th if this quarantine or this isolation is gonna continue which is gonna prompt a second wave of continuances. So as of now, it's unknown. And as much as I'd love to say the courts have their act in order and they know exactly what they're doing, no one was prepared for this. No oh. one has, has expected that this would happen. So everyone is trying to figure it out as they go through and they're honestly all doing the best that they can. Gina? Yeah, th there's also the issue of custody because before parties, can have custody heard, they have to attend something called CCRC, Child Custody Recommending Counseling. That is also being set, um, continued. So there's hearings that are set, let's call it for April. The parties were supposed to go to CCRC before they go to court. Their court dates being continued beyond April and they still haven't attended CCRC. So maybe they're gonna have a court date in May or June, they're gonna show up and then they're gonna be ordered to go to CCRC before they even get to court. Some, of, some people are gonna be continued out many, many months before they get to court, which is going to spark a new issue. It's going to spark a bunch of emergencies and the courts are open for that. I have something also to add is that I think everybody just needs to understand this is so unprecedented that if you, I, I mean, I wasn't practicing when 9-11 happened, but I don't think that the court shut down like this, even during that national tragedy. And I've certainly been in court where the hearings were still being conducted with the power going off, um, with flashlights and in the spirit of just trying to get everybody's day in court. So this is all new territory for all of us. And I'm sure that the courthouses really don't have a policy for something like this. So we're all trying to work together and figure this out. But there certainly is a learning curve to this as well. And Gina, to comment also on the CCRC issue, um, I think that's where, you know, again, we go back to this theme of trying to uh, come up with a creative solution. Um, putting a Band-Aid on certain issues that before we probably wouldn't have, you know, that you're, you're, you have a position um, and you have a right to have that position and you want to be heard on that position. But I think what, what we need to all really um, understand and try and process is, you know, those positions, while they seemed important a month ago, <laughs> now, you know, don't seem as important just because of the restrictions that we're facing, number one. Number two, I think that um, as far as CCRC goes, a lot of our clients do have very important issues that need to be addressed. And what I am going to uh, charge, if you will, to the court is that this is not the fault of the party that CCRC uh, was not conducted. And I am going to ask that the court consider ordering some temporary orders while they attend CCRC. And that might be more successful under, this, under this, these conditions that it wouldn't be before because usually courts are like, nope, I have to go to CCRC. But to no fault of anybody's, that's not occurring. So my thought is, is that I'm going to um, request that the judge specifically consider under certain circumstance that maybe this issue needs to be addressed on the day we get there and then send to CCRC. So those are conversations that we have to have with the court very respectfully. But, you know, we're, we're again, this is no, 
to no fault of anybody's. Um, it's nobody's fault. And, um, but we do need to, to address those issues as well. Absolutely. Okay, so we are coming to the end of this session. I know we have other topics such as support, property orders, uh, what's going to happen with homes that are pending foreclosure and things of the sort. Plus, I think we just scratched the surface of the custody orders and the current uh, court calendar. So this will be a series of podcasts that will be posted live. We do apologize for the error that took place this morning. There was the wrong link that was sent out. But rest assured, if you were not able to attend, that this will be posted on our website. It will be posted on our YouTube channel and other forms of social media. Your team here is um, ready and willing to help you. If you have any questions, um, issues that were not addressed during this recording but can't wait, please make sure that you reach out to your legal team here at Family Law Matters. And we do wish that everyone stays safe. We do wish that God blesses everyone and gets us through this. This is a tough time for everybody, so just stay strong. Um, be the hope that everyone's looking for. And again, I thank you all for joining this call. Um, please remember it will be posted and you'll be notified concerning other um, podcasts. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bless everyone. Bye. Bye. Yes.